We're now talking to Helene Becker, who is Managing Director, Air Airlines Aircraft and Container Leasing Air Freight at Cowan & Company. Thank you for spending some time with me. What I would like to start off with is the merged airlines in the U.S. and your expectations of how profits will increase and how they will spend that money. Okay, that's a, that's a fair question. It's broad enough. So, so we, we basically think that with three airlines and Southwest, so four big airlines controlling almost 85% of the industry capacity, they'll actually make quite a lot of money. Um, I think last year, the US, US GDP actually grew one and a half percent about, and jet fuel was three fifteen a gallon, and the industry reported an operating profit of over six billion dollars. And that compares to 2007, when US GDP grew about one and a half percent. Uh, jet fuel was two ten a gallon, and the industry reported an operating profit of about three point two billion dollars. So you see, operating profit doubled in the past six years in an environment where jet fuel is up fifty percent. And we think going forward, we're going to get better pricing because we're going to have a lack of decided lack of capacity growth. In part because who's going to fly these planes? There, there's not what I would call a pilot shortage, but there's definitely a pilot crunch, and we're definitely going to have. Um, we're going to have issues in terms of adding hulls, so I think you're going to see the number of seats per plane increase, and I think you're going to see, um, because you've got in, a, a lack of, of pilots and you really can't have capacity expansion in terms of the absolute number of aircraft, you're going to get um, increased pricing. So pricing, we think, will drive profits. Um, in, in the past five or seven years, it's been all about the cost side of the equation, and we think basically costs are going up. We think pilot salaries are going up. Fuel costs um, stable to rising slightly. And, uh, and in that environment, we expect to see higher, higher revenue. We're estimating kind of mid-single digits, so say 6 to 7% revenue growth for 2014, maybe 4 to 6% revenue growth for 2015. We don't really see the next kind of downturn to the later in the decade. And, um, you know, that should, should drive higher profits. If, if the industry did $6 billion last year, you know, we're kind of thinking $7.5 billion this year um, is our number. And, and we're thinking higher margins, higher return on invested capital. And, and what do they do with that money? I think there's three things they're going to do with the money historically. They've always given their, their, their employee salary increases while, you know, pilot salaries are definitely going up. Um, two, they buy new planes. The U.S. airline uh, industry probably has the oldest fleet in the world, um, maybe an average age of 12 years. We think that, you know, is coming down. United has a lot of 787s on order. Uh, Delta just sent out an RFP last week for um, wide body aircraft. They've got 40 narrow bodies on order. American has 400, I think. 400 left of the 462 aircraft order they placed back in 2011. We don't think they're going to take all those planes, but they're going to take a big chunk of them. And, um, you know, I think, uh, so they're going to spend money, basically spend money on new aircraft. And then the fourth thing, or third thing rather, is return capital to shareholders. So you're going to see dividends, which we haven't really seen across the board in, since I really picked up coverage of the group. I've been doing this over 30 years. and. When I first picked up coverage of the group, Delta paid a, a dollar a share annual dividend, and now they pay 24 cents, and we think it's going up. Um, Alaska Air last year announced uh, or announced their first dividend, uh, 80 cents annually, and now it's a dollar annually, so they raised the dividend 25% a couple of months ago. Um, we expect United to, raise, to initiate a dividend uh, of 2015. American surely will do a dividend probably 2016-17 timeframe. They've got some work to do with the merger and the balance sheet and so on. And so we expect uh, we expect we expect share purchase programs to continue, and we expect uh, dividends. When you talk about new aircraft, I'm thinking that given the fact that there's this demand, and there's a let's say a sticky supply situation with pilots, this almost certainly leads to upgaging. And we've heard a little bit about that here at ISTAT so far. You know, like moving from 320s to 321s at JetBlue, <laughs> which is unusual. Absolutely. Um, Delta now going with 321s. You you see more in, you see more of that. Have to be, have to be. There's just not enough pilots to handle what's out there. You look at you know you listen to the Boeing and the Airbus guys this morning and, and Bombardier and Embraer, and you kind of think about what's on order. I mean, Qatar, Emirates, and Etihad combined have over 500 aircraft on order. Norwegian has 300 aircraft on order. Aero Mexico 100. All seven. 787s on order. Um, International Airlines Group, the holding company for um, Welling, 
Iberia and British Air, 100 aircraft on order. You know, you just look at that, those, that right there is 1,000 aircraft. And then we talked to, uh, you know, the U.S. guys, American is roughly 400 still to go, and maybe they take 350 of them. Um, America, uh, Delta United upgaging, Jeff Louie talked about upgaging. There, there, there's, no, there's no doubt but that they have to put more seats per plane because, you know, if you're going, um, if you think about the new pilot rules that went into effect August of last year and January of this year, first of all, last year's rule that says you have to go from 1,500 hours, or you can only have, a, you, you no longer have 250 hours of experience to start, you have to have 1,500 hours. Well, it takes four to five years to get 1,500 hours of experience, and it costs about $150,000. That's not easy to do. It's not like it used to be. 250 was not an arbitrary number. The reason 250 hours was mandated for the smaller carriers, or, or for a commercial airline pilot to get started, um, is because you go to a four-year school, you come out with roughly 200, two and a quarter, and you can get the last 25 or 30 hours within a year. Um, and that's problematic now because you need 1,500 hours. It's very difficult to get those extra hours of experience um, without going to fly cargo or going out of the country to get your experience. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about, sorry. Sorry about that. It was annoying me. <laughs> it was it was ringing. Um, and then the other thing to think about in terms of, you know, upgaging and, and why we have to do that, the, the other rule that went into effect um, on January 4th that said pilots have to have 10 hours of rest instead of the former eight hours of rest, and, and it's a rolling, you can only work uh, 30 hours in seven days, and you can work 100 hours every 30 days as opposed to 100 hours a month is the max, because the FAA mandates no more than 1,000 hours a year. Well, the um, the bottom line is that Restricted that rule demand. alone restricts pilot availability. The industry had to hire 5,000 pilots just for that rule. So you have you don't have a lot of pilots who are trained coming into the system, and then you you've got a lot of pilots that that have to be mandated rest. And then we haven't even discussed the roughly 45,000 pilots in the U.S. that are retiring over the next decade and a half to uh, to the 65 to you know just turning age 65. And you know it's not like this is a surprise to the airline industry. I mean, they have the dates of hire for everybody. They knew when people were turning 65. They just, over the last five years, because we've gone from the age 60 to 65 retirement age, nobody really was hired, the U.S. big guys anyway, haven't right. hired in right. a decade. So there was nowhere for them to go. So you have no choice but to up gauge. So, so let's do a, a quick quick uh, review on some of the programs um, out there, given given the environment you've described. How do you see things like C-Series, the Neo, Max, and let's say the the E-Jets? The e um, okay, so the those are jets. like three different planes um, to really think about. So, so I think the E-Series seems to be kind of the leading, it seems to have the leading edge over everything else in its class. It seems to be the highly desirable plane. It seems to be a little lighter. Um, I think people like Bombardier products in general and by comparison from the Embraer products, but I don't really see the C-Series, um, no pun intended, but taking off. The, the, uh, I'd be surprised if Republic actually took their order, um, frankly, uh, just because I know they stopped paying pre-delivery deposits on the planes. Bombardier has, has obviously, it's an aircraft that's been delayed, not that, you know, it's a surprise, most new. Most new aircraft programs do get delayed; they don't deliver on time. Um, but but the reason Republic bought that plane was for Frontier, and they don't own Frontier anymore. So I'm not, sh I'm not I don't know what they do with those planes. So I I'm not sure they're going to actually take it, um, take them. So I think the Embraer has the leading is the leading uh, provider in that class, that size class. Um, but I think Bombardier will give it a good go. And then the Neos and the Maxes, so now you're talking up a little bit. So you're going from roughly 100 seat aircraft, 90 to 100 seat aircraft, to kind of 120 to 150 or more seat aircraft, right? The, the, the uh, Max 9, I guess, and the, and the A321 Neo, you're talking in the 180 roughly category, seat category, 184 seats. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, everybody loves those planes, but it will take years to replace all the planes that are already in service. We're, we don't, 
really see the current engine option aircraft going away for for a long time because I mean if you're if you're a big aer U.S. airline I mean if you're a big any airline and and you buy a current engine option aircraft you're going to probably right now you're probably going to get a pretty good discount on it and you're going to um, use it for 30 or 40 years especially in Delta's case they like to use their planes for a long time um, and you're going you have you have very little residual value risk if you're a leasing company you're not going to buy that plane because you have huge residual value risk if you take a plane now and you put it on a 12-year lease when it comes off lease in 2024 you're right in the heart of the maxes and the neos being delivered so your residual value risk is huge so we don't really see um, the leasing a demand from the leasing companies for the CEOs. I mean, the NGs right. maybe, but not the CEOs. The NEOs certainly, and and uh, and that's those are are going to be those are the workhorse of the fleet. I mean, when you think about worldwide aviation, roughly eighty percent of all flights are two hours or less. So, you know, those make sense. And and I know there are places in Asia where they rely on wide body aircraft and they treat the wide bodies like we treat the narrow bodies here. Um, and that's just because there's no infrastructure other than airport infrastructure and, and you have to get around the island nation somehow and it's all by air. That's, that's not really what we're talking about here. We're sort of ignoring those, those markets. If you compare the, you, you, you obviously were, um, you and I both heard the presentations earlier about 777X and the 350XWB. How do you see that, that competition playing out? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I mean, clearly they're both uh, well, desirable I... aircraft, right? They both have a mission. I guess the way I think about it is every aircraft has a mission. And the missions are just tweaked enough different or just different enough? I, I guess I should frame my question like this then. You've got Boeing with 787 and 777X. Right. And they make the argument that they've bracketed the 350. And Airbus makes the argument that the 350 is in the sweet spot of those two combined, and they offer one solution. Do you think that in that kind of trade-off and that argument, which one carries more weight? Is your what's your yeah, sense of that? I don't really know the answer to that question, frankly, because they both have their good points, obviously, and there are some airlines that prefer the Airbus aircraft, and some obviously are, are Boeing, you know. Boeing centric or versus Airbus centric. It's you don't really get. I I, I mean I think it, and in the end I think it comes down to mission. I, I think it's really mission critical in the sense that yes the the A three fifty claims to bracket the kind of two so you only need one where where in the other case two one versus where two will do. But but I feel like what Boeing is offering is a different alternative, right? The 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 answer is. I mean, you look at what, what people have on order, it's because they're doing well, specific long haul missions or specific, you know, the demand for a certain market is, it requires, it's either long and thin, so maybe it doesn't need as big a plane, so, you know, a smaller plane will do, and, and, and you have the 7878 or the 9 or the 10, I guess, to choose from, or the, if you really are looking at almost a 747 replacement, the 777, 777. Is, is probably your man, and uh, you know it's it's just a, it's just mission critical, I guess, is the way to think about it. And I think the other part of of that is um, is is uh, whether you're Boeing centric as an airline or, or Airbus centric, and how good a deal you can you can negotiate right. in terms of what you're paying for the plane and on a per seat basis. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.